tonight's 93rd episode of Elizaviews Whining About Movies is brought to you by the first annual Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival, the only international film festival that's also intergalactic, open to any extraterrestrial that chooses to enter. We'll even waive the $25 entrance fee. You know, that's cool, isn't it? Wouldn't that entice any extraterrestrials to reveal their presence to the Earth? And at least let us watch their movies? Who knows? I don't know. Do you know? No, I don't. Well, I'm excited to talk about this movie. Are you? One of my favorite Bonds. Is it? It's one of my favorites. It is. It's an atypical Bond film in many, many ways. It is. That's true. And uh, I'm very excited to discuss it. And I hope you are too. I am. I am. I think you have a lot to say. I do. I do. I'm still digesting, but yes, I have a lot to say. It's actually way really late. It's because we went to bed really late, and this is a really long movie. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and most importantly, your sommelier of cinema, Robert Meyer Burnett. But you didn't come here to see me. You came here to see this lovely creature. And who might you be? I am Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell, the ace, the arbiter of cinematic excellence, and... The enchantress... Of entertainment. Nice. <laughs> and we are here to discuss the sixth James Bond film made by Ian, Eon, Eon Productions. Eon. Eon, not Ian Productions, but Eon Productions. It was based on a book uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service that was released in 1963. Okay. A year after Dr. No came out. Oh, a year after. So Bond okay. had already become a cinematic phenomenon when this book came out. I imagine I did not look up the sales figures for the book, but I imagine they were through the roof. How many books are there? Well, are, oh, they, I, are all the movies based on the books? No, okay. because they ran out of Ian Fleming's books. Right. So, uh, License to Kill, for instance, could have been based on John Gardner's book, License Revoked, which John Gardner started up a new Bond series in the 80s. Okay. And he wrote books like Broken Claw and Four Special Services. Okay, but how many, how many of the original books? Oh, well, they pretty much, you know... They they pretty much they 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 adapted all of the books for the most part, but then there were stories, uh, like there were stories that Quantum of Solace was a story in one of his anthologies. Okay. So they're out of the books. Um, the world is not enough. Got its title from this movie. We find that the Bond right. family crest. Right. Has the motto "The world is not enough." So. Well, shall we serve up some wine? Let's serve it up, babe. What do we got for us here? What'd you get? Was is this a trade? Oh no, this is not no. a Trader Joe's special. I got this at Vaughn's. Another Pinot Noir. Ooh, I like this. Folly of the Beast. Yes. Fall. Look at this. Look at this label from Folly 2018. Folly of the Beast. Folly of the Beast, from 2018. A lovely, lovely Pinot Noir. Why don't you give me your glass and I'll pour it up. Pour it up. You didn't do a very good job taking a little sticker off the bottom of my glass. Is that why you took this one for yourself? No, no, this, the, no, this okay, was just, mine from yesterday. Oh, I'm just that checking. I washed. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, then let's drink to Peter Hunt, second unit director and editor of the Bond franchise, taking over as director for this film, which the editor of this movie, John Glenn, yeah. went and did the same thing on For Your Eyes Only. Very cool. And directed a number of Bond films, which we'll get to later, including The Living Daylights. Well, here you go. Cheers to that, ladies and gentlemen. Gentle beings, kind souls, any of you from the 28 known galaxies. Mm, that smells good. You didn't pour me very much. Look at that. <coughs> oh, see, you don't like it, so you got to give me more. No, I like it. Sorry, I was just not, you know. I'd... Well, this is a very good... Mm. It is very good. See, very good. these are bigger, so there's less wine left. See, there's not not a whole lot left when we've done that, because these are big. These are wide body glasses. So I tried to wear my most '60s looking sweater because of this this mustard yellow color. The fashions in this movie are <laughs> tremendous. And do I look different to you? You look different. You look great. You look very '60s. I borrowed Zoe's false lashes. Look how huge they are. Wow. Wow, the world is not enough for those lashes, let me tell you. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> I had to look the part. So, you do. You always look the part, babe. Every day, you look the part. 
You're a woman out of time. It's very strange looking out with false lashes. It feels like there's something on my eyes. <laughs> that sounds to me like it's a song lyric. It's very strange looking out with false lashes, meaning like falsehoods, lies. It sounds like that could have been a lyric to a Shirley Bassey theme song. We should make a song. <clears throat> you know what this James Bond movie does not have? <laughs> what? A theme song. It does well, not have a title track. It, it has a great not piece. Not a theme song, but it has a piece of music. It has a piece of music inside of it. The piece of music that's over the opening titles. By the way, Maurice Binder doing great work for the opening title sequence of this movie. But before we get to that, let's talk about the pre-title sequence of this movie where Bond finds Teresa de Vincenzo, uh, a woman that, that creeps up behind him in, in a great... The Bond franchise has a long uh, history of having Fords. Ford cars and a Ford Cougar is in this movie. My mom had a Cougar growing up. It was navy blue and it had a tan top. That car was pretty cool. Well, <clears throat> James Bond has a, an updated Aston Martin in this movie, which is very cool. And of course, uh, Tracy cuts in front of him, is rude. I guess it's the break of dawn. It's like late night. Bond's, yeah. Bond's out of late night. Uh, coming back As from always. we don't know where, but uh, except this Bond, He's and not she races Bond. in front of him, and then then Bond comes across across her car parked on the side of the road. Yes. And what happens? And she uh, is going towards the ocean, and she takes her shoes off, and she continues into the ocean. And do you think it, do you think when a woman takes her shoes off, it it means something? You think it's significant? Did you know that she was going to try and take her life? No, I just thought she was going to. Put, dip her feet in the in the water but then she kept going and then she kept going yeah. she's gonna drown herself drown her sorrows so and then, her life yeah and then what happens so then james drives his car onto the beach so he can run and save her run and which, save her which he does he which saves he does. her and then as they're coming out of the ocean these two guys um attack <clears throat> These thugs attack. Yeah. Probably working for her father that are trying to Probably, look over but we her. We don't know that at this point. We don't know that. And so one of the guys takes her and starts taking her towards the cars. And the other guy just, I mean, there's a huge fight sequence in the ocean. And we have to, I have to, and from, on the beach. From an editorial standpoint, what I think is really cool about this movie is there's a judicious use of jump cuts. Mm -hmm. The fight scenes are made that much more intense by the jump cutting. So there isn't there there's not long when someone gets punched, you don't necessarily see the follow through and it's not in one shot. It's jump cutting, which became popular many 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 years later, but Peter Hunt being a director and an editor sort of did some really interesting stuff throughout the film. He speeded up shots. Like when cars drive by, he would speed up those shots just to add a little bit more zhuzh to the yeah. scenes. But it's a good fight scene. All the fight scenes in this, in this movie are pretty brutal. Yeah. When Lazenby throws a punch, it's not like this. It's He scoops up from under and like, not even a haymaker. I don't even know what that is. Guys go flying. It's great. Yeah, the fight sequences are pretty exciting. They're pretty exciting. And I like that they're jump, there's jump, jump cuts in them because it makes it a little more fast. You seem a little subdued about this. About the fight scenes? About the whole movie. Because I'm still digesting and try I'm trying to um, formulate my thoughts about it. I have a lot of thoughts about it. Well, we're going to get to those. But, of course, this the big the big elephant in the room, we might as well get past it, is yeah. we have a new James Bond. Yeah. Australian George Lazenby, who is a very handsome man. Do you think he's handsome? Oh, man, he's really? He's handsome, but he's not... He's not... I don't know. There's something about him that's not quite James Bond. Well, <clears throat> I would tend to agree with you, yeah. but I think he looks the part, he's physical, but you know what he doesn't have? Yeah. I think what's missing from him is the inner twinkle. He doesn't have the charm. He doesn't have the charm. He doesn't have the, he's a little rough and tumble. He's a little Australian outback when he needs he to be is. a little bit more Eton College kind of a thing. Yeah, he's not. He needs to be more Oxford bred, and you, you, you don't right. believe that he was a, a British naval officer. No, you really don't. He doesn't have that suave that James no. Bond has. No, he's not suave. I mean, it would have been interesting if this was like the first James Bond movie and then he was replaced by Sean Connery. But yeah. it's not. It's really... I mean, but Sean Connery might have been one of the toughest acts to follow 
in yeah, cinema history. I mean, come on, Sean Connery. I know. But but it does have, after the fight scene in the beginning, right before the opening titles, it does have one of the great fourth wall breaking moments in all of cinema history. Oh, yeah? Did you know when he looks at the camera? Oh, and what does he say? As he watches Diana Rigg, one of my favorite Bond girls, so beautiful, Emma Peel, she's so yes. so gorgeous, and Very so funny. she has a, a just a strength to her. Uh, Bond's equal, and how many, I mean, how many women would Bond fall in love with? See, this whole movie doesn't really feel like a James Bond movie, except for the action Well, hang on a second. We haven't got to the fourth wall breaking line. What does he say when he watches the woman that he just saved drive off and leave him there on the beach? He says the other guy did He happen. says this never happened to the other this, fellow. This, this never happened to the other fellow? Fellow, yeah. Oh. And you laughed. I thought that was hilarious. And he looked right at the camera. He looked right at the camera. And they got away with it. It was like an office moment. The office. I know that I know. Yes, I know. And um, and what did you think of that? I I loved that. I thought that was hilarious. It was great. Yeah. But now, what's very interesting about this film is it really is two movies in one. And the first forty five minutes of this film are are a romance. I mean, Bond rescues Teresa, then he goes and finds her at her hotel, at his hotel. And they begin a kind of a relationship. He, they go and they play cards. They're playing a little baccarat. They, and well, he rescues her like she. Yeah, she, she she bets and she doesn't have any money. And then when she loses, she can't pay. So he has to bail her out again. Again for the second time. Yeah. Then he goes and has a drink with her, and she's like, "Why are you always bailing me out?" Yeah, she has like a death wish. Yeah. She's not happy. No. She's, She's like, got you demons. Can, you can risk anything if you don't want to live. That's what she says. <laughs> Something like that. And uh, she's, you know. Um, yeah. So they spend the night together, but but. Well, no, I mean he's like he, so she she goes up to her room and he sends up caviar and champagne and then goes up there and she's not in the room. This big, burly dude starts attacking him. Yep. And it's another great fight. Huge fight scene. They're throwing each other around, breaking shit. They broke that hotel room like rock stars, they didn't did. they? They did. They did. Like rock stars. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah. Then he goes to his room, and she's in his room, and he's pissed at this point. He doesn't know anything about it. He could have lost his life. They could have killed him. They could have killed him. That dude was huge. He he's was. He's like young Yafet Koto. Yeah, that Who guy. actually shows up and live and let die. Okay. The same guy? No. Oh. But a guy who looks similar. Yeah, he, he was menacing. Menacing dude. Mm -hmm. And that's not the last we see of him. No. And uh, and then Bond goes back to his room, finds Tracy there, and she's like, I'm here to do business. It's yeah. very transactional. Yeah. Just like any other rich heiress running around Europe. Right. You know? A countess. And, yeah, but but she's been rich all her life, silver spoon up her ass. Spoiled. But she, spo she tries to get in trouble. She lost her mother at an early age. She didn't really have a mom, but... Yeah. You know, we don't know who her father is, but her father must be some kind of guy, right? He's he's something. Yeah. Yeah, so um, they end up sleeping together. They sleep together, finish that transaction. Yeah. And she pays him back in full, 20. She 20, gives 20 francs, 20,000 20, 20, francs. 20,000 francs. So then um, he goes, where does he go? Well, what's interesting is he's he's got... I, I love this so much. Harking back to Goldfinger, we see him the next morning. Tracy has disappeared, paid him off, taken off. He is in the, this awesome outfit with this orange shirt and this kind of brownish, beige-ish, like, pantsuit jacket, yeah. like windbreaker and magic... And, a, and his golf club slung over his shoulder. He's yes. clearly going to play 18 with somebody. Yeah. And he gets waylaid. He gets, he gets uh, in, the, in the hotel lobby. Yeah. They take him away. They take him at away. Point. The take, same guy who beat him up. The same guys. Yeah. And um, then they take the, take him to this mansion and... Well, no, they take him to the shipyards. Oh. Yeah, they take him to the shipyards to meet to meet Gabriel Frazetti. Yeah, but that fancy... No, that... remember that first they go to his office. Like, they go to his... He's one of the great industrialists of Europe. I know, but once he's in his office, it's like this fancy. I thought it was his. Well, house. yeah, but that's like the, it, no, his office. It, no, it's it just looks nice. He's got oh. a really nice. So, so that is Gabriel Frazetti, who plays Mark Ang Draco. Right. Or Mark Mark Draco. He grew up in Corsica, but 
he, and he but he speaks Spanish, so it's kind of a weird because on Corsica you're, you either speak French or Italian. Because Corsica went between France and Italy. Well, he's Italian, but he's like he's like the Vito Corleone of Europe, and he is described later. So he's supposed to be Italian. Okay, he's, I misunderstood. He, he's in I charge. He, I heard him speaking Spanish. Yeah, he could speak anything. He's but a bandito. He be speaking he's a... Italian, if he's from Corsica. I don't know, babe. He's he was drinking Calvados though, and I love Calvados. Okay, well there you go. He's okay. I've been to Corsica. So so Draco is is he's described as being the biggest. He has the biggest criminal empire in Europe, but even his criminal empire is dwarfed by his uh, legitimate holdings. Right. He has construction mm -hmm. companies all through Europe. But his operation isn't nearly as big as Spectre's operation, right. which is worldwide. But so, what does Draco want? Why? Why is Why is Draco brought Bond to him? He wants Bond to marry his daughter. He wants Bond to marry his daughter to, because he thinks that his daughter needs a man to dominate her. To dominate her. What do you and think he's about that? He's willing to pay him a million dollars in gold bricks. Well, you liked your gold bricks. That's got to be the kind of dowry you'd like, right? He's paying James Bond to marry his daughter. And guess what? James Bond marries his daughter. Well, well, spoiler alert. <laughs> Come on, oh people my have God. watched it. I can't believe you just spoiled the end of the movie. So did he marry her for the gold bricks? Well, what did you, okay. No. Why are we going to get there now? Come Sorry. on. I can't believe you. I take it back. Wow. I can't believe you did that. That was rude. But so, and so what, what follows is something we've never seen in a Bond film. There's a love montage where they're enjoying Europe together. Yeah. They're riding horses and they're, they're visiting museums. Hands, they're holding swinging, hands. Swinging hands. And, Bond yeah. falls in love hard. Not because he's going to get a million bucks. That, see, there are multiple layers to this movie that make me feel like it's not James Bond. First of all, he doesn't <clears throat> seem like James Bond to me. Okay, first of all. Secondly, the, he's falling in love. Okay, but hang on. We have to mention. Thirdly, like I said, he gets married. <laughs> okay, for, first of all, Bond knows that uh, that Draco, like Draco uh, from Harry Potter, like Draco might know the location or whereabouts of Ernst Stavro Blofeld, the head of Spectre, the supreme, the supreme headquarters for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, and extortion. What about him? Draco might know where oh, right, he is. Right, right. Sorry, so, I was reading the chat. That's why I wasn't so listening. So Bond is interested in what he knows. So Bond has been involved in the last two years looking for Blofeld. Yeah. From, from the end of You Only right. Live Twice, he's been looking for Blofeld, and they have an operation, the ongoing MI6 operation is Operation Bedlam. Yeah. And Bond finally goes back after he's been MIA all this time. They don't know, M doesn't know where he is. The PM doesn't know where he is, and he shows back up at the office, and he says, "Look, I've got, I've got, I met Draco. He might, he might, uh, he might have a, a lead for me to find, um, to find Blofeld. Let me go. Let me go." Yeah. And and M says no, and then Bond goes into Money Penny after some flirtation. What does he What does he say to Money Penny? Take a memo. Take a memo. Uh, tell him I quit. I quit. I'm resigning. I'm resigning. And then and he uh, goes into his office. Did and you, you know? see, Bond has an office. He has an office. He has an office with, at MI6 headquarters. With a picture of the Queen. With a picture of the Queen. And what did what what is interesting about that picture of the Queen? She's still the Queen. She's still the Queen in 1969. The Queen is still the Queen even yeah. today. And guess what her name is? Elizabeth. You're my Queen, babe. Aww. My Queen. So and then <laughs> we see we hear a really cool montage of music. We hear underneath a mango tree from Doctor No. We hear from Russia with love. <laughs> they kind of skip Goldfinger, but then we go yeah, to Thunderball, the rebreather. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, so he's got it, it, to to tie the movies back. They did the same thing in the opening credit they sequence. Did. Uh, you get to see like Ursula Andress, and you get to see uh, all the characters. Pussy Galore was in it. Yeah, so they're tying that back together in case the audience, you know, hasn't sold that this is a Bond movie. Now yeah, we know. Well, that didn't help much either didn't feel very bondy except for the music and the action sequences sorry i love this james bond movie it's I one know. of my favorite bond films it's because you're you you like romance 
Oh, that's why it is, huh? Yeah, because he falls in love, and there's that romantic montage when they're walking in the park, and and you know they're even shopping for wedding rings. At they one are, point. So and and they romantic. they come back later, and he buys that ring. He does. But but then we do spend uh, a long period of time while they romance each other. Right. And and um, uh oh, then but there's a little subterfuge. Money money penny does not say. Does not write a memo that says. Right, she doesn't. She says. Because he goes in to see uh, M, and he says, "Your request is granted," and hands him a piece of paper. Two weeks leave. And he can't believe it, and he walks out, and then he tells Mon- Monty Penny that it was approved, and she's like, "Well, read the note," and he's like, "Oh, two weeks leave." And then Bond says, "Thank you, Money Penny," because he realized that was a stupid thing to do. You yeah. shouldn't have done that. Then right. thank you, Money Penny, for saving me. And then in a nice touch, when Bond leaves, M calls back and goes, "What would I do without you, Money Penny?" Yeah, after James Bond said it to her. Yeah, so they get so so Money Penny and M, a little bit of subterfuge, and they get Bond to come back into the not yeah. resign. No, he's just taking two weeks off. Yep. And then he he falls in love. He gets you get love. Mo- like forty five minutes of this movie is like we don't even have like a yeah. villain plot. Nope. We haven't even seen the villains. It's a romance. Oh, it's a romance. We should have kept this for a, for a Saturday. Well, we could have. I was going to suggest this once. It could have been a romantic. We should have done this on Saturday. This is for our Saturday. This is our Bond romantic Saturday. Yeah, except we're going in order, though. Yeah, we are going in order. Um, but then, of course, Bond discovers something. He's got. He finds out um, from Draco. Says, "Look, that that Blofeld uses a lawyer, Gumbolt, mm-hmm. in Switzerland." And so using right. using his and, and one a great gadget a, a Bondy and gadget not provided by Q, right? It's, Bond breaks into the lawyer's right. office and, and they they ship him a safe cracker and a Xerox well, I machine. Mean, it just so happens that his office is right next to a construction site that what is his name Draco Draco yeah Draco it operates and so they're able to use a. What are the a huge crane? A crane to bring in this contraption to break into the lawyer's um, files. The lawyer's files, and and they find in the lawyer's files. I mean, the plot of this movie. It's if you really break down the plot of this movie, I love this movie, but the plot's pretty goofy. It's really goofy. So so we find out, especially once you get to Switzerland. So we find out that. Uh, the Comte Balthazar de Blochamp uh, <laughs> wants the the College of Heraldry in London to to ratify his claim that he is the Comte de Balthazar is, de Blochamp. Yeah. And and Bond realizes that no, that's that Bl- that's Blochamp is Blofeld in French. And so and so Bond is going to go undercover as Sir Hilary Bray <laughs> from the College of Heraldry in yes. London. And, right? and and to go ratify his claim uh-huh. to the title. Very silly. I mean... But I love the outfit that he wears with the round glasses. Well, and then at one point he's wearing a kilt. And what's so funny is is the entire sequence when Lazenby is playing Hilary Bray is dubbed. His voice is actually dubbed by George Baker, who plays the character of Hilary Bray. What? Yeah. George Baker dubs Lazenby's voice as he's impersonating him. So weird. And so and so and so Bond is taken to one of my favorite lairs in any Bond movie, yeah. Piz Gloria, uh, which is a real place, but it's it's the it's I don't even it's it, in the it, Swiss Alps. It's in the Swiss Alps. It's the headquarters for virology. It's oh they have a they have God. a research the institute. Is so weird. A research he's, institute he's for researching f- allergies. A- all kinds of allergies. And so there's a room full of women who have allergies. Well, hang on. We have we we have to meet. I mean, Blofeld's second in command. I mean, Goldfinger had odd job. But, right, right. But but Blofeld has Emma go- ha- Emma Blunt. <laughs> Uh, no, what? Emma oh. Bunt, probably. No. Pardon me, Emma Bunt, like Bunting. Oh, it should have been Helga or something. No, it's it's uh, Irma, Irma Bunt. Irma, Irma <laughs> Bunt. Irma, Irma Bunt. Played by uh, Elise. She Stepat. was great. I have to say, all she's the, awesome. All the acting in this movie, hers is the best. What? You don't like Draco? 
Believe, uh, come on. Draco's great. Draco's great. And Diana Rigg is great. Yeah, and Blofeld is great, too. Tully's, and Telly Savalas, Kojak himself, who loves you, baby? Why they decided to cast Telly Savalas as Blofeld as some international man of mystery? I love it. I love it, too, after being played by, um, you know, uh, Donald Pleasance and You Only Live Twice. <laughs> it's He's now, Donald Pleasance has morphed into another bald dude, Telly Savalas, who's much bigger than Donald Pleasance and has got that kind of New York voice. <laughs> He's got that, yes. I mean, if you really look at it, you could say that a lot of Austin Powers, while it is about the Bond franchise, a lot of Austin Powers is kind of about this movie. Yes. In particular. Yes. Yes, it is. But. You can see why. But why don't you, why don't you explain, so what is Blofeld's plot in this movie? (laughs) What is it he wants to do? And why does he have, by the way. I would be remiss if all of the he's got hot chicks that represent all the nationalities and all the oh kind my God, of women. They're from all over the world. All they, of the world. They all have allergies. That Joanna Lumley. Cured. Joanna Lumley <laughs> is one of them, and um, and uh, uh, and also um, uh, Catherine Shell. Although she's not she's not billed as Catherine Shell. She's billed as let's see how is she billed in the movie. Um, uh, no, it doesn't say on this list. But Catherine Schell, who would later show up as Maya, the metamorph on Space 1999. Cool. And so Hilary Bray is there, and he when he gets there, he's shocked to find all these women. All the women, and he's wearing a kilt. And he's wearing a kilt, <laughs> and they love that. And he, and, and he is not shy about... No. He's, he's, like, flirting with all of them. Oh, yeah. And um, bullshitting them with talk of... Of their, you know, their heritage and their ancestry. Oh, absolutely! And it's supposed to be playing this other dude. And it's fantastic. Yeah. But what is what is Blofeld's plot? What's really going on here? Yeah. What is his plot? (laughs) He gets lost in all this weirdness. Well, he's. Oh yeah. Okay. So, um, he's. Wait. What is it he wants? He wants now. He he's. His threat is that he's going to use bacteria to kill off they're gonna yeah, yeah they're, they've made a he virus get, he, what does he want again he, he wants, wants money basically but he, he just not wants just money? wants money no he what he wants what he wants he is wants money. he wants his title recognized he wants his title you're, recognized you're kidding me he no. wants his title and some and money. he wants to be pardoned he wants Par- to be pardoned pardoned for what for all of his crimes but he's still committing crimes but he's still yes it's yes Mm-hmm. So he hypnotizes these women under the premise that he's healing the their them he's healing their, their allergies. allergies. He's brainwashing them to go he release them. a bio warfare agent throughout the world. Throughout the world. Come on, man! What's wrong with that? <laughs> it's just hilarious. Well, it's a little it's a little convoluted and goofy, and it feels like it's right out of a. Uh, it feels like it's out of a Bond parody film, like yeah. in like Flynn or a Matt Hell movie. Yeah. But still, <laughs> it, it's an excuse for Bond to have a group of women in close quarters that he can... Right. He can... Although, you just saw a love montage where he falls in love and buys an engagement ring, but then he starts flirting with all these women, and even... Doesn't he sleep with the curly-haired yeah. woman? Yeah. The, like the American. She's the, she's the, she's go- the American. She's the goofy... She's kind of the Gidget. Yes, yeah, she's, she's like Gidget. She's the Gidget. And you know she's the dirtiest one of all. The dirtiest? Yes. She's well, she's the, the one who writes. She writes her her room number on his thigh. Yeah. At dinner. She's the dirty girl. She, she's, she's the one she's that'll the, give him a rim job. She's, she's the, dirty. She's the dirty American girl. She's the dirty American. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes to her room and, you know, bow chicka bow wow. Yeah, I, I mean, and but then, he's on the job. He's on the job. Oh, that's okay. It's okay. He's engaged, but it's okay. He's on the job. Well... Yeah. He's undercover. He's undercover. So it's okay. It's sure. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, uh, you know, th- while this is all going on, Bond's trying to figure out what's happening and all this. Yeah. And he, he, but then things go pear, pear-shaped as they do. Yes. So he try- has to escape because at one point, um, Blofeld figures out that he's James Bond. Yeah. And they put him in the mechanic room where the, 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 gears to run the what is it and you, you kind of think <coughs> the uh well the the, the, the sky lift yeah uh, the uh but what are those called it's not the ver- i want to say vernacular the the vernacular there's a no. name for those 
There's a name. Yeah, the the the. Do you guys know the name the, for that thing? It's, it's it's not a lift because that's that's just the little the sky seat. cars. The, it's a whatever. Sky, yeah, the sky. What are those called? God damn it! The, the gondolas. Whatever. <laughs> gondolas. What are they called? Oh, anyway, so he's um. He's in there and he climbs out and he he escapes and get, get, finds a ski suit and a pair of skis. And this, I, the ski sequence... Okay, first of all, let me just tell you. This is the first time in a Bond movie we have a ski sequence. Yeah. And as a kid, the reason I wanted to learn to ski... Oh, the ski... ...is because of James Bond. And and I learned to ski. I started skiing in the fourth grade because of James Bond. Vernacular, you were right. Look at that. No, it's vernacular is making a joke. It's not vernacular. Vernacular is language. But it starts with a V. It's a vernacular. Vernacular. Vernacular is something like that. It's not vernacular. <laughs> no. Yeah, vernacular. Vernacular, no, right? Not with an F. Cable cars. <laughs> no, not cable car. <laughs> It's a funicular or gondola lift, whatever. That's why I said. Gondola lift. Okay, we all know what it that, is. But it has a proper name. It does. Somebody Google it for crying out loud. <laughs> anyway, whew, skiing. Okay. Now, I skied as a child. Yes. We went every winter to go skiing, and that was our winter vacation. We had a summer vacation and a winter vacation. My parents were European, so that's what we did. My, my public school, Mercer Island, Washington, uh, would bus a third of our school. We had about 1,400 people. A third of us were bused every Saturday to ski. Oh, nice. I mean, that that's that's the kind of place I grew up in. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> skied every winter, too. And so seeing the sea ski sequence was very exciting. Right, and we had the, the great Willie Bogner actually uh, skied backwards to get some of these that's ski insane. sequences. And, you know, I have to say I've one of... i backwards, not uh, on purpose. Yeah, not... <laughs> I love ski. I'm a I'm a pretty good skier. Um, well, I, could... I used to be. I haven't skied in like twenty five well, years. I haven't skied since I was married. Because I don't I don't have any friends that ski. So there's no... I ski. Well, we should go ski. We, we should go. Should we should ski. go to Mammoth because I love Mammoth. I've never been to Mammoth. Mammoth's incredible. I would love my kids to learn to ski. We can stay at the Austria Hof. Well, your kids can learn to ski, but not on our time. I don't, I don't, no, 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 I, we get them classes, and we drop them off at the class, and then we go skiing. We'll see how that goes. Well, <laughs> they could stay on the bunny hill. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's what you do to learn. Uh, it, it is true, but I just don't want to be around people that are learning to ski. Well, they're on the bunny hill, and we go up. They'll be there for about 20 minutes, and then they're wet and cold, and they and can't so ski, and they'll go and to angry. the lodge, and they'll have a hot cho chocolate, and they'll be happy. And then they'll be calling you and yeah, being they'll be like, like oh, where so are you? Bored. I'm bored. Come on. No. You're right. Forget it. Sorry, Sophie, if you're watching. <laughs> we'll facilitate ski lessons. But, um, okay, so so there's a great ski sequence. And, yes, there's a lot of rear projection. And some of the rear projection is a little goofy. It's a little goofy. But there is a lot of, I mean, some of the backgrounds, especially They're later. They're saying funicular is correct. Is, it, is funicular is correct? Great. Uh, funicular, that's good. That's correct. Um, so, so, although I thought a funicular was more like a, like a like a cable not a not a like a yes me too i thought it was like the like, subway like, like the like, hill on um angels uh what is it called in downtown that little yeah train yeah that goes yeah 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 that's that's a funicular. what is that yeah yeah like when i i went i went skiing i was in switzerland skiing in uh, davos yeah and they have it goes up nine thousand feet it's awesome by the way if you're a skier and you haven't skied in davos switzerland might i recommend doing so uh, it's some of the best skiing I've ever ever had, and they you get up I think eleven thousand feet and it's above the tree line and it takes you you can ski if you're okay skiing through uh, trees, you can ski all the way down the mountain into the town. Oh, that's cool. It's like an hour long run. It's incredible. I was there for ten days. Show off. I know. What can I say? It was great. And then I went to Zurich for New Year's. Well, that's awesome. Just saying. But so anyway, the great only, ski great ski sequences in this film. The only part of Switzerland I've been to is Geneva. Oh, I'm, I say I want to go. Because my mother went to college in the mountains, the the French Alps overlooking Geneva, and so when we went to visit there, uh, we went into Geneva. Yeah, I didn't get to go. I didn't go to Geneva. But anyway, we're we're off topic. So so Bond, it's a ski sequence, and it's getting pretty tense because they chase him into town. 
and and he's pretty tense like he's a little it's scared tense. he's like yeah he's like flinging people off the cliffs and and it's crazy it's and you get to see some some people fall pretty far i mean they're now, dummies but they're in good. this movie they tried to include every single winter sport that you could think of <laughs> including a road rally yes including a, a race so 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 then so then bond is a little worried like he doesn't know what to do he doesn't have a weapon Right. And he's so kind of he, sitting there in the crowd trying to hide. Yeah. And, and who just sudden, skates up? Who skates? I mean, what? It's it's. I mean, the, how first does of all, she happen to be there at the right time? Can we talk about how delicious she looks in that skater outfit with one of the she's shortest shorts, shortest skirts ever? With her legs, the camera pans up. She stops right in front of Bond, and the camera pans up her body. Come How's on. he going to explain Gidget? Well, yeah, I mean, he has he showered since he's, he's still got, you know, a little bit of Maybe something. Maybe he does. Something. But you never know. It doesn't matter. She would she would understand. She's she's European. She gets it. He's on, he's, he's, on, he's on the job. He's doing the work he has to do. Yeah, right. He's saving. And plus, he wouldn't tell her because he says, I can't of tell you. Of course he wouldn't he, tell her. It's on her. He's on her Majesty's Secret Service. It's right. all secret. So anyway, she's wearing a fox fur, which is very sad, but it's really beautiful. <laughs> she's, she looks beautiful. Oh, my God. Um, Unbelievable! Yes. And there she is, right, right in front of him. And 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 she he says, How "Do you have a she car?" She happened to be she's ice skating. So well, there's another winter sport added in. She's ice skating. Well, clearly wherever they are, that town, do they know where Christmas trees are made? Do they know where Christmas trees are made? There is there's some. I can't I can't sing that song. I by the way I I, I just want you to know that during the love montage they did play. We have all the time, and I did not. I refrain from saying that. That's where the song that this movie, the song that this movie th that is known for, is that Louis Armstrong song. I I did not sing it in deference to you. You did sing. You said you sang last night. I sang it. You did, but not tonight. I just gave you a little bit. Oh come on, with your Yoda voice. Come we on. have all the time in the world. Time enough for love. To or, or life to unfold all the precious things love has in store. I can't. It's, it's just <laughs> it's it's too. It's so muppety, honey. Thank you. That's my Lou Armstrong. <laughs> that's not a muppet. That's Lure. It's muppety. Oh well. Mm. But I love the Muppets, so it's all good. Anyway, I love that song. <laughs> I love "We Have All the Time in the World." Yes. It's it's and it's a repeating motif. But so there's a long protracted sequence where Teresa and and Bond try to escape Blofeld and his forces. Yes. You know they already he skied down the mountain, but now Tracy okay, and Bond are fleeing. Okay, so now they fleeing. get in the car and they're being chased, and they end up in a car race. They go into a road rally. They ride up into a road rally. You got the Mercedes Benz with Blofeld and his goons, multiple Mercedes Benz, and and Emma Emma Brunt, and uh, uh, then you've got these. <laughs> Irma. Irm, did I say Irma? Did I say Emma? I keep thinking Emma Irma. Peel. Irma Brunt, not like Emily just Blunt. Call her, just call her Helena. Irma Blunt. Irma Brunt. It's <laughs> Irma Brunt. I keep thinking Emma Peel. I'm all I'm all discombobulated. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100% Muffetti. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Tickle Trunk. We have all. <laughs> so, mm. so anyway, the long, I mean, Road rally, another winter sport I didn't even know was a winter sport, and they've got like Mini Coopers in this road rally. They do, you know, it's like mini, it's a road and rally. They smash of, into the Mini Coopers. They smash God into the Mini it. Coopers. They finally get out and and <laughs> and they, they they sneak into they they sneak into someone's into a barn. barn. They pull in the 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 cougar. Yeah. And um. And they um, first he makes some declaration how they're not going to have sex until until the new year. Until they're married. No, until the new year. No, he's like his, re his, his new resolution, year's resolution is that they're not going to have sex until they're married. And then he kicks no, out the jams he's and he's like, it's not the new year yet. <laughs> but what's interesting, the movie goes from this incredibly tense, long protracted action sequence yeah. that has car chases and ski chases and machine guns and, and then to another romantic scene. Well, that's very typical of James Bond. I mean, he'll yeah. be like in this huge action, almost dying. And then the next moment he's, you know rolling around in a parachute and then and then the next morning blofeld and his goons show up at this farmhouse they've tracked him to the farmhouse 
and Bond and Teresa have escaped on skis. They have. Leaving behind the cougar. I know. You ever wonder what happened to the cougar? And the fur. The fur's in the cougar. And the fur. The fur and the cougar, man. That cougar is sweet. Yeah, so they ski, they're ski. they skiing, and then the, the goons chase them. And it's another great, beautiful daytime ski sequence. Yeah. Beautiful. More skiing. More and then, skiing. And now we're going to add in another winter sport. Well, first well, of all... Well, not yet. First of all, they trigger... Blowfield, Blowfield triggers, triggers an, avalanche. an avalanche, which covers them up. And and and, and then they, they well s- they 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 find uh, Teresa. Yeah, he says go get the girl. So they take the girl, and then James Bond comes out of the snow and um ends up chasing Blowfield. No, 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 not yet. No, 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 no. What no. Next? He goes back to London. Bond cuts back to London and Bond's talking oh, to M right. and Blofeld's made his demands like what he wants he wants a pardon now and, and right. all this well he, his plan is very flawed because why would you steal why would you steal the second most you know villainous villain's daughter I mean you know they're gonna come after you why would you do that? That's, Who, hubris. that's a stupid plan. No, 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 no. Because because Blofeld knows he's the 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 a he's the Lex Luthor of the James Bond universe. He is a number one. He is. Um, no, it was a bad plan. I don't think it was a bad plan. It was a bad plan. Why would you steal her when? Because 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 I'll tell you why. Well, maybe. I mean, I don't know if Blofeld. Oh, Blo- actually, it's Blofeld knows all about it. He's he's an egomaniac. He doesn't think any. He's like I can get. I don't have to worry about anything. I guess so. So he makes his demands, and then uh, uh, M tells Bond Operation Bedlam is over. Right. It's over. It's done. They don't it's even care d- about the girl. Who cares? Don't care about the girl. That's so rude. Operation Bedlam is done. But So what, is, what does Bond do? Bond calls up his future father-in-law and says, Draco, your construction company, how about a little demolition? How about a little demolition job? Yeah. And it cuts to, and every time I see this, it cuts to these three helicopters. Yeah. These three Vietnam era Hueys packed to the yeah, rafters of men. That's and, silly too. Okay. What? This guy, what? Blofeld, steals the girl, right? And then these helicopters are flying over and they're like, go away. You're not supposed to be here. And we're, we're, like, taking, we're taking, oh, we're taking, we're taking medicine to the flood victims. Yeah. Yeah. It's Come awesome. On. Like they would believe that bullshit. And like the Swiss, the the uh, the Swiss Air Force flying these kind of lame planes. But it doesn't matter. It's awesome. It, this is awesome. The end of this movie is so awesome. This helicopter attack on Piz Gloria is is one of my favorite things in the entire Bond franchise. It is awesome. Dude's throwing hand grenades. Bond comes out of a helicopter with a machine gun, sliding down an ice uh, uh, an ice. You know the with the gun. It's awesome. And there's this incredible battle. Already, this movie is super long, and it's like, okay, now we're going to do another action sequence, and we got to include all the rest of the winter sports. (laughs) Well, I love the fact Blofeld's minions are wearing jackets that have the Olympic Olympic, symbol on them. Only one of them has the Olympic symbol. Well, yeah, he's like the head guy. Yeah, why? I keep wondering. Maybe he's a fan of the Olympics. Or maybe he was an Olympian. Maybe he was. It doesn't matter. It's awesome. This battle scene is awesome. Yeah, there's more. They rescue. Skiing, they rescue t- Teresa. They and, rescue yeah. Teresa and and. Well, and, her father punches her in the face. Which is and Bond had slapped her earlier. She's really abused in this movie. No, it's for her own good. It was a different time. Anyway, it was a different time. So anyway, it ends up that James Bond and Blofeld are chasing each other. Well, yeah, Piers Glory gets destroyed. His his laboratory, his right. laboratory, it as they say, ex- exploded. Blows up in a beautiful Derek Meddings miniature, multiple miniature shots exploding. It's amazing. I love it. And then they find their way down the mountain, which is a lot shorter, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Then it was skiing. Then it was the day before. But it doesn't matter because it's awesome. And, and then th- they end up in a bobsled shoot. Blofeld finds the bobsled shoot and Bond jumps onto the bobsled. They're your last, chasing each other. Your last in winter bobsleds. sport. And there's a, they're having a, a fist fight on a moving bobsled yeah. down a bobsled course. Yeah. And it's awesome. It's awesome. 
And and first of all, can we just give a shout out to the awesome John Barry, the man who scored this movie? This film score has probably the greatest score of any Bond film. The music score in this movie is on point throughout. Yeah, it, the music is great. It, it the the love themes, the action themes, the suspense themes, the music, everything about this film, uh, the music is 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 the music just, is great. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's one of Barry's best scores. Mm -hmm. And the the main the Honor Matches the Secret Service theme that plays over the opening titles is phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it doesn't get much better. Yeah, it's good music. It's good. So so this bobsled chase eventually, Bond causes Blofeld to get smacked. Gets like, caught in a tree, and he makes a corny. There's a lot of corny lines in this movie. And what does he say? Uh, I don't he got hung that. up. Oh, he got hung up. <laughs> he got hung up. He got hung up. There's. Some pretty corny lines. There and are. I'll tell you something. The corny lines are not delivered with aplomb in this. He they doesn't... aren't because I don't think his acting is... Sorry, I don't think his acting is very good. Well, okay, we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about that. So we're, we're, at, we're at a point in the movie that's, that's... We cut basically after this to the wedding of Bond and Teresa. Yeah. And they get married, and Money Penny's there, and M is there, Money and Penny's M gets to bond with Draco and asks about a, a it's previous. It's father-in-law now. Well, no, no, M, M Bond's boss. Oh, I thought. And you they were... talk about yeah. a previously existing occurrence. Like, how'd you get away with that? You got away with the loot, didn't you? And M's like, you got away with that. Draco's like, hey, you know, you know, everyone loves him. He's Vito. He's the Vito Corleone of European. Crime. He's, yeah, he's kind of a cool dude. I like. Him. Everyone likes him. Yeah, he's like, from Corsica. One yeah, of my he, favorite places on people Earth. understand. You know, crime's a part of life. As long as you're not killing people and selling drugs to kids in schools, it's exactly what Vito Corleone would have. If you just believed, if you just did, if Salazzo just believed in Vito's, there wouldn't have been any problem in The Godfather. Victor Salazzo wanted to sell drugs where drugs shouldn't have been sold, and Vito didn't want to do it. Well, Draco's like Vito. He's got a heart. Even though he's a criminal mastermind, he wouldn't do anything that's going to hurt kids. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So anyway. So anyway. Cheers to that. So they get married. They get married. Bond gets married. Weird. Teresa Bond. By the way, call back in Free Rise no, Only. He said, Mrs. James Bond. Well, that's right. Mrs. James Bond. That's 60s. Yeah. What, you want to be more liberated? Well, could I have at least used her first name? Okay, well, it's still the 60s. I mean, you're on the cusp of the 70s. Technically, 1970 is still a part of the 60s. I can't stand There was no year zero. So, 1960... Okay, whatever. I know, sorry, anyway, we'll get into we're that. we're going to argue about that again. It's 1 to 10. All right, sure. 1 to 10, it's not 0 to 9. It doesn't, does it matter? It doesn't matter. 61 to 70 is the 60s. 71 to 80 is the 70s. 81 Dude, to 90. who cares? Okay, I'm if just you're saying. Gonna, if you're going to talk about decades, we talk about the 60 to, to 70 is a decade. That's wrong. Who cares? I do. That's the, that's the way we do it. There was no, no, you count 1 to 10. Matter. 1 to 10. It doesn't, oh my God, I'm not arguing with you about this. Anyway, it's, um. Not something to argue about. All right. Well, so anyway, <clears throat> Bond gets married, and and they're all happy, and they're leaving, and and Draco gives him the, uh, gives him the million dollars, and what does Bond do? He gives it back. He does. Yeah. I didn't. I he, missed that part. He doesn't. He says, "I don't need your million dollars," and puts it back. Oh, he's it, really in love. He's really in love with Even Teresa. He did it with Gidget. That was all part of the job. <laughs> he didn't have to. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Well, he's still Bond. He knows he's going to settle down soon, so he might as well get what he can, when he can, how he can. Come on, man! What? What are you agreeing about? The zero to the the, the one to to whatever. Look, S beams like not in years, Rob. Yeah, well, that's because it's wrong. When you're born, you are zero, and you count the months until you reach age one. Yeah, and then you're one years old. You don't. You don't. You're not exactly. zero years old. You're you are zero year years old. When you're born, you are zero. Not if it's Japan. They count the time you spent in the womb. No, 
in the, okay, this is not Japan, okay? When you're born, you are zero. And then when you're one month old, you're one month old. And when you're two months old, you're two months old until you reach age one. And that whole year is not erased. That's a whole year of your life. When you're counting. No, I'm not arguing about this. I'm just saying. One to ten. No, because zero is still. It's not that's zero when to the ten. year starts at zero. Because there's there's nothing before it. So the year starts at zero, and then after that year is over, then you count one. Then you're in the first year, and during that whole year, you're in that first year until you reach two. And then when you're at two, you're in the year of, of two until you reach three. So what happens after they leave the wedding? Money Penny is crying because Bond's leaving. Q says he's going to miss Bond, even though he fucks with all his equipment. So what happens? Shocking. A shocking ending. One of the most shocking endings of any movie ever. Uh, right? They're like, oh, let's let's have a romance. Oh, they're going to get married. So they get married, and then two minutes after they get married, she gets shot in the head. Shot in the head, yeah. and the movie ends. That was their solution. And by the way... It's like, a, oh, he's going to get married, but uh, no, he's not really going to be people married. People can We're talk about... kill her off within two minutes. You can talk about George Lazenby's acting all you want. The last moments of this movie, he is terrific. He's terrific. She's just having a rest. We have all the time in the world. We'll be we'll be moving on soon. Yeah, it's that's, heartbreaking. It's, it's, it is heartbreaking. every time I watch this. I teared up. I teared yes, up when we watch it's, it. It's a very I teared um, up. I always tear sad up. Sad moment. <clears throat> it is a sad moment. So and then you you're looking through the the windshield glass where the bullet has gone through and hit her head and she's fallen over and then it just cuts to the James Bond theme and the credits roll. Yeah. What a gut punch. It is. The ending is sad. Well, before I ask you what you think about the film, uh, we have a letter. <clears throat> we have a letter from the chairman. Jeffrey Mao has written a letter. Greetings, Robin Elizabeth and Eliza viewers. This is a letter that I'd already previously sent in to be read for observations, but since you guys are talking about Honor Majesty's Secret Service, I figured I should dust this one off and have it read again for the show. I've made a few edits to update it and suit it for Liz of Yous. Recently, I'd purchased on Her Majesty's Secret Service on Blu-ray. This in itself is significant in that this is the only non-Daniel Craig James Bond film that I have owned on Blu-ray. In fact, I only have Goldfinger, The Living Daylights, and Goldeneye on DVD. I think that's all I have, although for some reason I have the impression that I have From Russia With Love. I'll have to go back and check. This letter won't be a review of Honor Majesty's Secret Service per se, as it's being discussed today, but more of a discussion about my lack of collecting Bond films on home video, a few thoughts about Honor Majesty's Secret Service sprinkled here and there, and why I decided to get Honor Majesty's Secret Service finally. So I've been feeling nostalgic about OHMSS after hearing of Diana Riggs' death, and she's one of my favorite Bond girls and one of my favorite classic and classy actresses. I haven't seen much of her filmography, but I caught her in The Hospital on streaming, which co-starred George C. Scott, and it was quite entertaining. It's very good, actually. The disc was on Amazon for a good price, and I figured since I didn't have many Bond films, I'd get this one. I guess part of the reason why I don't have many of the Bond films on home video, like DVD or Blu-ray, is that I simply watched them so much as a kid that I didn't feel the strong urge to then get them again. I think it was my cousin who copied a bunch of them on VHS for me, or I'd record them off TV. Also, I probably also probably what happened is that after I started to read all the Ian Fleming novels, I got into this the book is better than the film mindset. So the films are kind of devalued in my estimation. Also, I tended to, at least early on in the DVD and Blu-ray era, buy new mainly new releases. I would of course go back and buy older films, but generally not ones I'd seen so much of, like the Bonds. So I never got like the complete set or whatever. I just picked and chose. And, and this opinion might be controversial, but Bond films never seemed to me to be great examples of cinematic excellence. <laughs> they were all professionally very well done, for sure, with large budgets and top-tier production design, costume sets, props, and the like, but they were never going to win Academy Awards. The main creative crew were company guys like Guy Hamilton or John Glenn or Louis Gilbert. They directed Bond films, but nothing else of note that were not Bond. Competent and all, but clearly the series was producer-driven, and they did the jobs that they were told to do. Bond films seemed to exist in their bubble. People would watch Dr. No or From Russia With Love or Goldfinger, but never watch any of the other films from 62, 63, or 64. It's like how you'd, you would watch The Three Stooges, but never watch anything else in black and white from 1935. It should be apparent to you that my enthusiasm for Bond has waned over the last couple of decades. 
After Roger Moore retired, I enjoyed Timothy Dalton's turn in The Living Daylights, which we're going to watch this week. As many of us book fans felt he was the closest to the literary bond. Unfortunately, that didn't sell the tickets or was much of an interest to the average film goer, and License to Kill did not kill it, because it's bad. After the long hiatus till Pierce Brosnan and Goldeneye, Bond diminished more and more to me. Only Brosnan's and then successor Daniel Craig's respective first Bond films were the ones that I've liked in their runs. The longer and longer hiatuses between Dalton and Brosnan, then in between Brosnan and Craig, and then this last drought after Spectre have not helped. Legal battles and the lack of a strong, successful studio backing the franchise constantly kept its future in doubt. As for Honor Majesty's Secret Service, there's a lot about it that explains why it holds a special place for most Bond fans. I'd previously written about how Honor Majesty's Secret Service would have been Connery's best Bond film if he'd been committed to it. It's a unique and distinctive film for many reasons. The only George Lazenby film, the only one where he gets married, and the first film where he skis. It served as kind of a pivot point, transitioning from old Bond to new Bond. When Bond is checking out of the hotel, when he first meets Tracy, he's carrying a bag of golf clubs. This will be the last time that we see Bond have anything to do with golf, sadly. This is the only Bond film set in Europe during the swinging 60s. We see M's estate, quarterdeck for the only time. As far as I can tell, it's the only Bond film set during Christmas, and even making a reference to the time of year. During the infamous opening pre credit scene where Bond says this never happened to the other fellow, does he start to turn and look at the camera as it fades to the title sequence? I never noticed this before. If he did, it's a cheeky, he's a cheeky bugger. Or maybe it was passed off as, yeah, that's just where his eye line was going. No, he looks in the camera. He looks in the camera. Or maybe that's how he was directed. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to throw in a look while delivering what was already a pretty fourth wall breaking line anyway. <laughs> if you're going to have him say that, might as well have him do that. You could think of it as a bit of a wink to the audience to prepare them for what's in store. Keep in mind that the audiences of the time would have been going in with some trepidation as to this new bond, and it was probably done to put them at ease and disarm them a bit, absolutely. Like to say, don't worry, it'll be fine. In terms of how the film looked, it looked fine to me, I guess. I bought the British version, so oddly the 20th Century Fox Entertainment logo and fanfare come up first. That's also on the American disc. I guess they had distribution rights in the UK, and in they actually took over the distribution of MGM discs for a while. It looked like how a Blu-ray of, of a 1969 film should look. If it ever happens, I'd be up for getting the original Connery films on 4K, give it a proper restoration a la Spartacus or Lawrence of Arabia. I don't know if I'd get all the more films, although For Your Eyes Only is probably my favorite of his, and Octopussy is okay with me. You don't love Spy Love Me, which we're going to tell you why it's the best Bond film, and I, of Roger Moore's tenure. And I especially enjoyed the whole sequence to Disarm the Bomb. It had a tense, serious tone that was more in keeping with Connery than Moore. And I'm even able to overlook the clown makeup because, well, he didn't have many other choices, right? Given that we are in the James Bond spirit, expect more Bond-themed letters from me. I'm sure that you'll be getting plenty of them, as his popularity is quite high amongst the PGS. I'm looking forward to hearing them all. And your thoughts on the movies being reviewed. Well, until next time, I am, as always, your humble chairman, Jeff. Now, I want to point out that Jeffrey Mao, our chairman, wrote me something after last night's review of Gold... Uh, Gold... Uh, finger that yeah. uh he explained that only odd job is korean that the other minions uh goldfinger's army is actually all chinese and he's actually being oh. financed by the chinese oh. it's said once in the film and apparently there's chinese being spoken so oh well wow i okay. would like to correct that misperception yes that i we... just assumed they were all korean mm. i was wrong and i'm sorry right so, well, let me ask you, before we jump into what people are, are sending us in here, what what did you think of this film? This film's very entertaining. I mean, there's, there's great action sequences in this film. And um, it's it's it feels different. It feels like a different... Because I could tell you didn't love it. it. It He doesn't feel like Bond to me. And... Um, I don't know. You know, I'm such a Sean Connery fan. Right. That it's hard to transition. It's just like transitioning from from one uh, Star Trek franchise to the next. It's like you have, go through this mourning period and you miss your old friends. And then you, you just have to keep watching to, like, make new friends. I don't disagree. And so it's kind of like that. It's like Sean Connery, and, and you know Sean Connery is so dear to me. <laughs> and so to transition to um, to Lazenby, who didn't feel like James Bond to me, 
he didn't have that charm, that swagger, that, you know, suave. I mean, I, I look. Plus the story, like he gets married. That seems weird to me. That's so not James Bond. So I, 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 I really love this movie. I've always loved this movie. I, 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 I see it as a different take on the character. And like, I, I go back and watch You Only Live Twice, which I loved as a kid. Because Little Nelly, the flying gyroscope, and the, the, the they go into space, and but I, I I have a hard time watching You Only Live Twice now, and a lot of I mean Doctor Evil is based on Donald Pleasance's Blofeld in You Only Live Twice. This film, look this I think this really did a, a good job of bringing the Bond franchise back to real life, believe yeah. it or not, and and like you you do you see these European locales and. You 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 you're going to casinos and you're seeing, uh, you're meeting cool Europeans and a hot European babe and you're skiing and you're in Switzerland and it feels very. I loved the scenery. I loved the skiing and all the winter sports. Um, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and I I I mean yeah, the plot's a little goofy, but I I I think that, it, it to me it, it it you know what you know what this movie feels like. It feels like it's a Bond adventure that I could have had. Oh really? Like, yeah, like like I I I believe I believe. <laughs> really? Yeah, like like I don't like when I watch Thunderball, I feel out of my depth. I, I I'm not a scuba diver. You know, I've never been certified. I've scuba dived. I love yeah. scuba diving. I've never been certified. But like this movie, I can ski. In an avalanche. You know, you know when I I Are you I, bobsled. Well, maybe not. But but it, it, but I've I've seen bob. I've actually touched bobsleds and. I, I mean, I relate to this movie. I, I like of all the James Bond movies. This is the James Bond movie that I can see myself in the most. Could you impersonate a uh, a, a man from the College of, of yeah. Heralds? No, I could not be Hillary Bray. And I, you know, I'm I'm I, I would always imagine that Bond is is well endowed. I just don't have that endowment. So if you reach up my kilt, you know, you wouldn't be as impressed. But well, still, she only wrote on his thigh. Yeah, but you know, she grabbed his. He, well, she went for the scrote. I mean, she did, know, she went for the scrote. They, they were. Um, he even made a. This was one of the corny comments. He said something about. Oh man, I wish I could remember the line, but it was something about how he was getting hard. <laughs> well, yeah, she wrote. On uh, his yeah, thigh. I mean, you know, but but I I mean also th this feels a little bit more down to earth. And, and the fact that, you know, Bond, like he's, after escaping from them, he's sitting on this, this bench and he, he's worried. He doesn't know. I mean, it's, anyway. Yeah. Now, I think Lazenby acquits himself. And maybe it's because, you know, I could never be as cool as Sean Connery. But because Lazenby, I mean, he's incredibly a handsome, he's a very handsome guy. But he, he doesn't know as much. Yeah. He's a, I, I, I could be like, <laughs> I never thought I could ever be like Sean Connery's James Bond. But I'm like. As a little kid, I'm like, I could be that Bond. I could be Lazenby. I like, I could never be Connery. <laughs> I see. But I'm like, I could be Lazenby. I could be that guy. Yeah. And by the way, I should mention that when I was uh, uh, had a, a VCR and was getting all the Bond films, yeah. The only way they this was the last Bond film to be released on pre-recorded video cassette, and the only way you could get it first was on the RCA CED disc player. And I went and got I, uh, my my company that I work for bought one to rent out, and no one ever rented it, so they sold it to me for fifty bucks. So I bought it for nice. fifty bucks when I was like sixteen. I bought it for fifty bucks, and I bought on Her Majesty's Secret Service on CED disc, so I would have all the Bond movies, and I copied it for my friend Mike Shirts. Oh, very cool. Yep. Very. That's very how. Cool. That's how. And I was a complete Bond fanatic. Yeah. So. Very cool. So there you go. There you go. Well, all right. We got we got people. Uh, we uh, people are uh, sending in uh, a lot of chats here. Let's see what people have to say. Um, what do you have to say as we continue on through this? Um, <clears throat> Stubble McShave says, "I have it on good authority that the new Bond movie has gotten a new title. There's plenty of time to die." Come on, Stubble. We're in a global pandemic. <laughs> I know the movie's been postponed a year. It's it's terrible. I, I hate the fact that there's a Bond movie that's it's finished. Yeah, we were supposed to see it last April. Yeah. Yep. What a bummer. Willow Willow Yang is here. Willow says this is the first Bond movie I've ever seen, 
and one of the last movies that I watched on VHS. What is the first Bond movie that you've ever seen? Do you remember? I can't even remember. I was so little. It would come on TV and we would watch it. Yeah, I mean, it was on ABC TV. Gosh, that's a really good question. You know, I can't... I, I want to say that the first Bond movie that I ever saw was probably um, Goldfinger. Okay. I think it was Goldfinger. Is that why you chose that for the Sean Connery film? No, because it's my favorite Sean Connery Bond. I mean, I I I've, I've, I picked what I th- are my favorite. Well, I mean, there's only one Lazenby movie. We're watching Spy Love Me, which I think is my favorite uh, Roger Moore Bond because it was returned to epic Bond, and it it was the first Bond movie I saw in the theater. Although I do really like uh, For Your Eyes Only a lot, mm-hmm. and I'm a Moonraker apologist. Yeah, you. I was like, you didn't pick Moonraker. No, I didn't pick Moonraker. <laughs> I'm, but I'm a Moonraker. One day, you know, <laughs> since we're doing this as an Elizaview special, yeah, maybe I'll finally release my drunk Moonraker commentary. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. Yeah, so I was gonna do at one point. I was gonna put up on YouTube my drunk commentaries of all the Bond films, and I only recorded one, which yeah. was Moonraker. And I think right. I drank whiskey and two bottles of wine. You drank a lot. And and I I would step in. And I, I said, here, we're starting, and I, I, I've i cut it together. <laughs> I, I should release it as an Elizaview special, my drunk Moonraker commentary. You totally should. I should do that. I, I, I figured that, like, if I ever tried to get a corporate job, I figured that I didn't want anybody... Th- this was before I started Rob's Observations. Yeah, I mean... You've already right. I mean, I've already, already I've already blown. torpedoed that. Can I mean, you imagine? That's already blown. So. Yeah, if I ever if, if the HR department's like, well, we're looking into your past, we're not gonna watch five hundred. How many episodes of stuff on YouTube? Have you, well, you know, whatever. But I I, I probably anyway. Um, yeah. So there you go. Um. So, but what was your first? You don't know. You don't remember. I don't remember. All right. It's tough. Probably e- a Roger Moore one. I mean. Uh, Ethan Holgate sends in a tip and says, Hi, Rob. I saw an article saying that Charlie Hunnam was asked about playing James Bond. He said he would be honored, but he thinks Tom Hardy is the front runner after Craig is finished. Personally, I think Hunnam would make an awesome Bond because not only is he a gentleman in real life, I think there's a Roger Moore, Daniel Craig vibe about him that would make a really cool Bond, in my opinion. Tom Hardy would be more of a tough guy Bond, but I think Chris Nolan should direct this first film. What do you think? Well, there's been a lot of talk about that Christopher Nolan, basically Inception is so influenced by the end of this movie. When they go to a they go to a version of Piz Gloria, there's an attack on the snow and skiing and all oh. that. My only problem with Tom Hardy is I love Tom Hardy, but here's the thing. I think Bond needs to look like whatever actor plays Bond, it looks like he needs to he, he looks like he needs to belong sitting at a Baccarat table or playing yes. at the, 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 the Casino Royale in Montenegro. And I, I just don't see... Um, I, 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 I love Tom Hardy, but I mean, if you've ever seen the movie Bronson, he, to me, he doesn't... I mean, look, he was really good in Inception. I just don't see him as Bond. He's yeah. kind of a thug. Yeah, I don't see I mean, he, he he's always played thugs. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it. Um, and even when Daniel Craig was first, uh, the first time he was Bond, I, I had a hard time. Like I said, it was hard. It was hard to accept him as Bond, but then, um, but then it became pretty easy to accept him as Bond. But I think he's only had one great Bond movie, which was Casino Royale, where he's just starting out as Bond. He, they've never allowed Daniel Craig has never been allowed to go on just a mission movie. Yeah, it, it's always been a part of this continuum, and I, it, I, I, I don't feel that Daniel Craig was ever given an actual real Bond movie to embrace. Well, after seeing clips of this new one, well, yeah, the new one, but again, he's coming back from retirement, and he's not, he's not the Bond that we know. I really wish he ever, he just had a mission that was given to him by M, yeah, and he had to go out and do something. I also yeah, think, you're right, because I think he he plays an amazing Bond. Yeah. And I have to say, I mean, you know, this movie, the European locations in Honor Majesty's Secret Service are, you know, Bond, after this movie, things started to change. I mean, I really like that the milieu that Bond existed in, 
he goes to in Diamonds Are Forever. He goes to Las Vegas. Like James Bond does not deserve to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> James Bond, if he's going to play baccarat, he should be in European casinos. I mean, he should be in 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 Monaco. Yeah, he should be in Monaco or anywhere else. And 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 one of the things I always loved about Bond films is is the European ness of yeah. them. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 it got to the point where nowadays the world the problem is the the thugs the people that threaten the planet Earth are are like the Taliban, you know the people that blew up the world uh, blowing up the World Trade Center would have been a Bond plot. They're gonna blow up the World Trade Center, you know, and and when somebody does it in real life and flies planes into buildings, but they're really you know Saudi Arabians that trained with Bin Laden in Afghanistan. It's like. Well, that's that's yeah. not cool. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, you, I I really want to believe. I really like to believe the megalomaniacs of the world are these rich, debonair dudes that wear bespoke suits and drive yeah. supercars or hypercars. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The problem is, I think the world itself has betrayed the Bond franchise. <laughs> The reality of the well, our yes. human existence on the world is betrayed. Bond. Well, nobody. First of all, nobody wears three piece suits. Nobody wears suits even anymore. No. So that world is long gone. Yeah, and that's. I think that's one of the real problems of the Bond franchise nowadays is that our world changed so much. Yeah. That that it it, it the asymmetric warfare and and it it's. That's why I think the Bond franchise has been struggling for the last, well, 40, 50 years. I mean, Bond worked in the 60s. Everyone talks about, well, let's go back and make a Cold War movie. Make Yeah, so let's put Bond back where we didn't have to worry about people flying planes into the World Trade Center. You know, let, let's have our let's have villains that like steal two nuclear bombs and bribe the West because they want a lot of money so they can go to they want to I mean, I like villains that just want to live well. Yeah, I mean, why not? Why not let it branch off into this fantastical world? Why not? I don't why know. does it have to be parallel with our existence? Why can't it be this separate world where people still wear three piece suits and the villains are these super villains that all they want are gold bars? And well, the the thing is, that we found out that the villains that are super villains are worth hundreds of, if not billions of dollars and they're hedge fund managers and they work on wall street. Yeah. I mean the, the like specter was, was only bribing the world for money. Right. Like we're, we're going to, we've got two nuclear bombs, but if you give us whatever, $10 million, we'll give them back to you. you. Give me my title. I mean, now you have people stealing, you know, the 1% have, have billion, the bond franchise can't even begin to comprehend. Yeah. And I that's think, why I think it should stay in its own world. I mean, I would totally enjoy to be in that world. But how do audiences embrace when you know that there are people like Jeff Bezos? Right. You know, who's who's building rock? He Jeff Bezos is Hugo Drax. He's building rocket ships. Yes. He has Amazon. Yes. He. I mean, he is. He's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah. He's worth more money than they could have ever conceived of when Ian Fleming was writing these novels. And I remember when Amazon just started. It was just books. It was just books, and and it's like I don't think Jeff. I, 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 Bezos, 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 whatever, if I'm saying it wrong. Um, uh, I, I just, when you have, when you have people like that, how do you make a Bond film and make it relevant? Is the Bond franchise, that's why I've said after Bond. Well, that's bon- why it has to be so far removed from our reality. But then it, then it becomes fantasy. Then you're, yeah. then you're in the Kingsman territory. Yeah. Which I like. I, I mean, I do too, but I, I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why I think the Bond franchise is a franchise that needs to end. Because the very oh, conception, but, that's heartbreaking. but yeah, but going out on a high note like Bond Twenty Five, there is there are sometimes when yeah, when look maybe maybe you're right. And look, I feel that one of the things that angers me about Star Trek yeah. is, is that the the world that we inhabit, this idea that it's all about us feelings, like let's make it about how we feel. Fuck all that. Star Trek was about ideals. It was about things that are bigger than we are, yeah. and it was about aspiring to things that we are that are more than us now star trek is all about this inner journey you know which is all part of star trek but now it's all about well you know let's talk about our feelings and and it's it's lost i mean i think a lot of our franchises part of the problem is is the ideals of being a character like james bond is an anachronism having those kinds of heroes and those kinds of of characters that that we can aspire to be 
We all laugh at that now. You know, nowadays, nowadays we can't even conceive because, I, I, I mean, it's sad, but the, the idea... Well, of, I think it's all, like I keep saying, it's all because we've lost respect for each other. I mean, um, Star Trek has always, older Star Trek has always been about respecting each other. And that's why it works. But now we live in a world where we don't respect each other in any way, shape, or form. Or, or I would say that excellence is not necessarily respected. Everybody thinks well, yeah. all people are the same. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, we used to respect our elders. Well, we don't anymore. Everyone we used to is respect the same. Whether it, you're 10 years old or you're 100, it doesn't matter. There's no respect for knowledge for for experience there's no no because everyone wants to be exactly equal even though you have no if you're 20 and you have no experience you expect to be treated like like somebody who's 50 who's had a lot of experience and and has experienced many things and learned many things and has so much more knowledge than you but no you have you are you are expected at 20 years old to be treated the same as somebody who's 50. Well, that's we've instilled in 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 children the idea that you're special, right? You know, and like they don't have to earn that anymore. R- right? Nobody has to earn that, and th- that's what I feel about Star Trek. I feel I'm watching a starship full of people that haven't earned their place. They're all fucking right. incompetent idiots. But that's because our society is like that now. I, I know, and I think that's problematic, and that's why I think the Bond franchise might it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Just a thought. So, Ethan, see what you said, see what you did. Julius is here, our, our official sommelier of this channel. Julius Goodwin says, just curious, did you ever get around to trying the winemaking kit? We have not. Mm-mm. We have not. I've been so busy, but it's on my mind because I have the two books you sent on my desk. Yes, and it's just because you've been school. You, you're yeah. painting, you're, 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 I mean, you're, you're... I'm so sorry, we really should. Like, when I get a break... Uh, for uh, the holiday breaks, yeah, maybe we're we'll going to make it. our wine. We'll make our wine. Yeah. That's good, and we'll film it too. And we should call it Goodwins. Our yes. first, it'll be Goodwins. That's wine. right. <laughs> um, we should have a label making contest. He, he says, it, "Oh, if not, when you finally do, remember to serve it shaken, not Mustard. stirred." <laughs> well, thank you for that, sir. I love that. Uh, Warren Wright sends in a super chat and says, "Just sending some love." I can't hang tonight, unfortunately. I'll watch the show tomorrow at work. Well, Warren, I hope you like it. <laughs> Roberto Suarez is here. By the way, he's joining us on Tuesday night. Didn't you skip one? No. No, I didn't. The Ethan? No, that was part of it. He did two-parter. Oh, you read it. Yeah. Okay. Roberto Suarez, who's going to join us for Spy Love Me, he says, I absolutely love Honor Majesty's Secret Service. I consider it the first soft reboot of the Bond franchise since there is a glaring continuity error with the preceding You Only Live Twice. In that film, Bond met Blofeld face to face for the first time. Yes, uh, in Honor, Majesty's Secret Service, they're reintroduced to one another, and there is no acknowledgement of the events of the previous film. Blofeld apparently doesn't recognize Bond as Sir Hillary, even though he's the same person he escaped from in the previous film. <laughs> it's true. That's absolutely correct. That's silly. Uh, Roberto goes on to say, at one point in its development, the idea would be that Bond had plastic surgery, explaining the new look of the new actor. But with this story element set aside, they just went forward with what they had, ignoring any sense of continuity. <laughs> well, continuity in the Bond films has never been a... No, and I don't think it's that important. Well, yeah, because I always look at the Bond films. Look, there there, there are moments of... The, the Daniel Craig Bond films have had a continuity. They're, That's they're like, true. It's all one long story, but these. Well, like like things are in in the world today. Things are always one long story. Yeah, I, I, There's I don't. No more episodes anymore. No, and I've always looked at the Bond franchise as being episodic. Like yes. each film, even though there's like, look, Felix Leiter, the Felix Leiter of Goldfinger is not the Felix Leiter right. of 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 Live and Let Die. Yeah. You know, so I've always looked at the Bond films and as the sort ja- of. You know, James Bond himself changes. So. Right. Yeah, so, I think each film is within its own world. But Roberto's right. However, however, when Connery comes back for Diamonds Are Forever, it opens up, where is Blofeld? And, you know, he's looking, he's pissed. He's, it, there's a montage of him looking for, he even takes the bikini, off, bikini top off a woman and is strangling her, wanting to know where Blofeld is. Uh, so that's uh, Cal is here from Swack Props. Hello, sir. I hate the theory that James Bond is a code name, and all the different actors represent different agents that inherit the code name after the other. 
These movies, despite the jumbled continuity, are clearly linked, and all of those actors play the same character. Look, I agree yeah, with that. I agree with that, too. And I'll tell you something. There's somebody on the on the internet, there's a few people, that have actually made an order to watch the Bond films in and think of it as in continuity. And the first would be Casino Royale. It, you forget the fact they're different Bonds, but the continuity. And I think it's, it's interesting, and it kind of works. Kind of mm. works. Kind of fun. Check that up. Uh, Warren Wright says, okay, one more. Robin Elizabeth, please do a true romance whining about movies soon. Uh, that's a great movie. We should do that. Oh, I don't think I've seen it. You've never seen True Romance? No. with Who's what? in it? Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette? No, I have not seen Oh, that. my God. Would you be surprised to know I have it on Blu-ray? How many copies, though? I only have one. They have not released what? very many. I know. They need to remaster <laughs> that movie. That needs a remaster. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk says it's 100%. It is not 100% Muppety. <laughs> I love it. What are you saying, Mr. Tickle Trunk? Did I talk 100% Muppety? <laughs> Maniacal laugh. Maniacal laugh. <laughs> uh, a spectator sends in a super chat and says, I swear my ears almost started bleeding rivers of blood oh, with the Armstrong on. impersonation. Oh. oh my God, that was horrifying. It's all right. I still love you, Rob. Oh, I oh, love it. Dear. I love it. Don't stop, okay? Thinking about tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk says, more Armstrong Muppet. Don't stop <laughs> thinking about tomorrow. Thing is, I love Louis Armstrong. And I, you know, I, feel, I, I hope he feels no disrespect, Louis. Uh, Swack goes on to say, hey, Rob, have you ever given any thought to doing a Christmas-themed Louis Armstrong the Muppets cover album? <laughs> Sorry, man. I love the Muppets, though. We should film you singing something in front of, of, yeah, on Ho Where is that on Hollywood and, um, no, the Jim Henson. I'm not. That's on La Brea. And yeah, no, on I'm La not, Brea. No, I'm not going. We there. should go right in front of it. No, it would be so cool. <laughs> the Squish Show says Bond's wife. May be dead, but I'm in the process of making one six scale deluxe Zeds, and one will what? be coming your what? way. What? You're kidding. Actually, I think two need to be coming our way. A Zed? Because I would not let you. I, I, no. What do you mean, no? He's got to send us two. Oh, come on. Don't put that pressure on him. He's making me a Zed. It better be this. The head sculpt's got to be good, man. It's going to be perfect. Oh, my God. <laughs> make sure you wrap his package with a bow. Well, he's, if he's doing a deluxe version, that means the, the, the outfit's got to be spot on. Make sure his package is the right size. By the way, you know what? If you're if you're really doing that, and you're doing a great head sculpt and all that, you should sell them. Totally. Make a mold of it. Yeah, I mean, no, but it. you can sell. I mean, people would buy that shit. Yeah, they would. And they would spend... I know they everyone spend, that watches this show would they watch would it, spend which buy as, a Z. By the way, as a matter of fact, if you really are serious, we should talk about that because it would be something we could sell. For him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we would sell it. Yeah. Yes. Make a mold of your uh, sculpt. Of course, he could sell it himself, too. But it'd be, it would be it would be fun. Like, I've always wanted to have the first observations, the first Burnett work action figure oh. that we could sell. Space Rob. Yeah. Could be. Uh, Aeon. I think it's Ion. Aeon. I love Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Great choice to watch, Rob. Would you like to see a Tarantino Bond movie? I think it would be awesome. Mm, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think oh, you'd like to see a Quentin Tarantino Bond movie? No, that those two styles don't go together in my mind. Really? I mean, I think. I, 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 well, I I don't know if he could. It, it uh, uh, maybe the problem is I don't know if he would be. If he would have, if he could do it without being sort of self-reflexive. Uh, yeah, I don't. I can't picture it. I mean, I love Quentin Tarantino. So uh, do I. I, mean, I absolutely love Kill Bill and Kill Bill Two and a bunch of his other movies. I mean, I love Django. I love once. I love Django Unchained. Uh, yeah. I I loved uh, Inglorious Bastards. I mean, yes. I'm a huge fan of Tarantino's so work. So am I. I think my favorite movie still is Reservoir Dogs. I mean, I love all of his movies, but I don't know about him taking on a. If he would do it with sincerity, Why, would it is be a, it something he's interested in doing? He's talked about it. Oh. Yeah, but if it, but I I think the thing about I don't know that might what, be interesting. But Quentin Tarantino, I think it's, it, he's it's like too, he's too it's too heavy. He's too 
I, what's the right word? Well, he's so himself. Like, I, if he's going to make a Bond film, he'd be working in a different paradigm. And if he made a Tarantino Bond film, like, it, I don't know. I mean, look, if if he did make a Bond movie, it's not like I wouldn't be first in line because I would yeah. be. I would. I would watch that. Yeah. So, That's I would. Interesting. Be. I didn't know he was interested. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious, but but I think it would be like a self-reflexive take. Like it would be. On the franchise, I don't know. You know know. what? This is growing on me. I think I, I think I'm good with this. Well, he's talked about it. Now I want to, I want to see this Tarantino Bond film. Yeah, I'm still thinking about the Squish Show making six scale Z figures. (laughs) Right? I'm getting a Z. I know. Well, you know what that means. (laughs) If I had a six scale Z, I'd have to have a six scale Zardoz. He's making it for me. Okay, you're right. I know. Okay, I'm just thinking. Jeez Louise. I can have an action figure for crying out loud. I gave you one of my Tyrion Lannisters. Yes, you did. Thank you. He's on my desk. I love him. Um, we drink and know things. We, we drink and know things, as we do tonight. Let's drink to us. <laughs> we drink and know things. Or some people would think we drink and don't know things. <laughs> Depends. That's fine, too. It's all right. Uh, Tim Beale, the spider monkey, uh, sends in a tip. It's Tim, how you doing? This is probably the Bond film it took me the longest time to come around to. I love it now and rank it in my top five Bond films. It does have my second favorite fight scene, the beach fight. It's so good. After yeah. the Red Grant train fight. I would agree with that. The beach fight is great. Yeah. And it's rough and tumble and it's uh, it's bad. It's badass. Uh, Bunyan, Sipe, Bunyan Spipe. He misspelled his name. Um, does Blofeld not immediately recognize Bond, suggesting they both had plastic surgery? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like uh, Roberto's idea. It's a total reboot. You can't worry yeah. about that continuity because, you know, the continuity is, yeah, it's not. Uh... Rob Korzak's here. For me, the best thing about Bond is the music. Um, yeah, the music is pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, look, John Barry, the, the you know, I'm a huge fan of Bill Conti's score from For Your Eyes Only, which is kind of goofy. It sounds to me like there's pieces of music that should be Sunday afternoon Sunday afternoon on ABC Sports, but I still like that score. <laughs> Michael Kamen's score, I don't like uh, from um, License to Kill. And um, I like the score for Goldeneye, which, you know, a lot of people don't. But what are you going to do? But yes, the Bond movies are... I'm a big fan of the music. I mean, I grew up with it. Yeah. Every time a new Bond film would come out, they're like, the 35th anniversary, and they'd release another... I mean, I have so much Bond music. I've got all of mm-hmm. it compilation move although i don't like i have to say i like billy eilish but i don't like sam smith and billy eilish i don't <sighs> bond themes are not like no whoa was me oh please i'm bond i do not like sam sad. i don't like sam smith at all no, he's I, a whiny whiny baby and i don't i don't like the whining i don't like the, i mean bond you need a kick-ass theme because being bond is fucking awesome yeah and and my man, my man. Yeah, the emo. The it's the emo. The it's too emo. I hate, fucking hate that shit. It's terrible. I am with you on that. Remember when you were young? Anyway, it's. Uh, you used to say, "Live and let live." You know you did. You know you did. You know you did. Uh, Tim says. Use this moolah to buy some lollipops. Who loves you, baby? Kojak <laughs> loves you. Kojak does. Kojak loves you. Um, Bob Korzak said, uh, as promised, I sent you a letter. Well, I look forward to reading awesome. it. Awesome. I'll read it tomorrow. Rob's observations will be back tomorrow. And, um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, well, should we dance into the fire, that fatal kiss? Yes. Uh, because we're at the end. We're we're at, we're at the time. That time. It's time. It's time for our bottoms up scale. It is, and our bottoms up scale is from one to four glasses. One to four glasses of wine. Although this is about one to two and a half glasses of wine, or one and a half glasses of wine, because we, these are big glasses. Oh really? You yeah. only poured one yeah. and a half times. Yeah, I only poured for us the same amount this time. I I really only want to drink one glass. Well, okay, but these glasses are huge. Oh, we should measure. We I have a scale. I don't want... Look, the day that I start measuring how much wine I drink is the day I put a bullet in my brain pan. Well, I like to know how much wine I'm drinking. No, you don't. It's only because, you know, you're, you're... Aren't you on some crazy I'm weird... Try, I'm trying to fix my thyroid, so I'm on a extremely uh, cautious... Well, I should really fix my weight and gut in general. 
by not drinking at all. But you know what? What can I say? Well, I mean, you could do what I'm doing, and you can have wine, but only one six ounce. Yeah, that's a day. A day though. Uh, uh, okay, a day. We we only drink wine every other day. Whatever. No, one we six drink, ounce. I only drink wine when we do the show. Hmm. Not true. Last week we didn't do a show, and I needed some wine because I was feeling like I needed to chill. So I drank eight, not even six ounces. It was I pretty drank, stressful. I drank four ounces. Where did the rest of that wine bottle go? None of your business. 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 That's <laughs> one <laughs> word. N-U-N-N-Y-A. <laughs> None of uh, Okay, well then, so on this scale of one to four glasses of wine, the Elizabeth's bottoms up scale, what yeah. do you give Honor Majesty's Secret Service? I'm going to give it three glasses. Three glasses. Yeah. It was entertaining. Uh, you know what? I this isn't to me. It's not a four glass movie, but it, it's three. And I don't know if there's any Bond film that's entirely a four glass movie. Well, last week you gave it four glasses. I know because Goldfinger. Well, okay. And it was Sean Connery. It was Come Sean on, Connery. Um, um. Go ahead, rate it. I'm gonna give it three and a half. Okay. Three and a half glasses. Awesome. There you go. Um, Journey's End sends in a super chat and says, love you guys. You should do the original Casino Royale. <laughs> the one for TV with Barry Nelson as Jimmy Bond. Also, off topic, do you think Brian Fuller would join the judging panel for the I, the, oh. <laughs> the Intergalactic Imagination Concerts Film Festival? I don't know. I haven't asked Brian Fuller if uh, he would he would do that. I could ask him. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I think the reason Brian Fuller and I are friends is because I don't ever ask him for anything. <laughs> and uh, that's true of most of my relationships in Hollywood. I don't I don't tend to ask people for things. Um, maybe I could have gotten further in my career, but it's just I feel I'd rather be friends with people than, you know. But Brian might, I might do that. That could be fun. I, I didn't think about that. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Why not? Why not? Why not? And uh, looking forward to sharing more movies with people and I uh, hope people are making more we're, we're we're coming up into the 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 second week of this month so we're rapidly approaching the end of the festival it's been yeah. interesting yeah but okay so Elizabeth we are doing on Tuesday night we are doing the spy who loved me yes uh, my favorite of the Roger Moore bonds the first I mean the Roger Moore bonds literally got smaller the, the aspect ratio got smaller for Live and Let Die and Man with the Golden Gun. But uh, Spy Who Loved Me was a return to the widescreen epic bonds that began with Thunderball. Yeah, I mean, Roger Moore, um, James Bond, is the one I remember the most. Because I feel like that's the one that was playing the most on TV when I was a kid. Right. So, because I was, you know, I, I was born in the 70s. So, um, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, so we're doing we're doing uh, Spy Love Me on um, on um, Tuesday. And that was the first Bond movie I ever saw in the theater, 1977. It actually came out of I think in July, so it came out after Star Wars. Wow! So I got Star Wars and Spy Love Me. I mean, wow! That's awesome. And I saw I saw the Spy Love Me at the John Dance Theater in uh, I was ten, Bellevue, Washington. It's not there anymore. It was a huge theater. It's the same theater I saw Logan's Run and Star Trek The Motion Picture at for a long time. Before I could go into Seattle, it was my favorite movie theater. Very cool. That's where I saw it, and I loved it. Awesome. Loved it. Whoa, so we're going to watch it. to watch it. We're going to watch it. All right, well then, first of all, I want to thank everybody, especially my moderating staff for being here. I want to thank Mike Bodden, Greg Smith, the Richard who is always throwing watch parties and Zoom parties over on the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page and the Whining About Movies Facebook page. Join them. Uh, tonight we have Joshua Levesque is here. Uh, MC Black Cap is here. Uh, the Richard is here. And uh, I want to thank you guys. Bunyan Snipe is here. And uh, thank you all for doing the great moderating job that you do. I do want to announce the Burr Network has a new show about physical media called Let's Get Physical Media, and it is with myself and Dieter Bastian. It is not a live show. It is a pre-recorded show that we're going to be doing once a week, 
I have recorded the first episode. I'm excited. And as a matter of fact, you know what I can do since I can do it here? <laughs> um, we, we have recorded the first episode. I'm putting it together. And um, uh, I think, let's see if I can find what I was doing. Um, uh, I, let's see. Wait, wait, where was it? Where did it go? Oh, here we go. Um, I can play you the opening title sequence. <laughs> So allow me to play. Here is the opening title sequence of the newest show on the Burnett Work, the once a week pre recorded show. Let's get physical media. So there you go. There's a sneak preview of our new show where we talk about what has come out on physical media that we've bought, our favorite special features, and what we are going to buy in the future. So if you're movie collectors, it's a pretty fun show. So check it out. What do you think about that? I'm excited. Why are you I can't excited? wait to watch it. It's, it's going to be a good one. Yeah. It's a good show. Anyway, I want to thank everybody. Take us out, babe. Everyone you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear and all you have to do is listen all you have to do is listen and with that what have a better night have a better night or as bl alley would say have a butter knife <laughs> see you tuesday see you tuesday so i'll gladly pay you on tuesday nobody does it better <laughs> makes me feel sad for the rest <laughs> nobody does it Half as good as you, baby, you're the best. Da na 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 na.